I think the greatest, our greatest mission in the world really is just to connect with one another, to be, you know, to talk to one another, to be kind to one another. I think that surpasses any cause or you know, political viewpoint. Just, you know, just talk to folks. This is Live at the Hall from the Country Music Hall of Fame and Museum. This week, a performance and conversation with Texan singer-songwriter Lyle Lovett, hosted by Elizabeth Cook. Thanks so much for coming and sitting with us here today. And um, so what have you been doing? <laughs> That's the question this year, I feel like. What have you been doing? I haven't seen everybody in so long. You know, it is extraordinary just to get to see our friends, isn't it? It is. Last night at the Americana Awards, you know, just to be, uh, of course, every time I sort of stepped into somebody's personal space to say hello, I felt funny about doing it. <laughs> but I did it anyway. And and uh, it was it was just wonderful, you know. Uh, well, I'd, I'd love that. And I, I wanted to, to point out something about you that I've always sensed, even though we've never really gotten to, to sit and visit, is... Um, how th what a thoughtful person you are. And we were sitting backstage earlier with the COVID nurse to test us to make sure I wasn't going to give you COVID and you weren't going to give me COVID. And um, we were waiting for his test, your test to come up to see how you fared. And uh, we're both negative, by the way. And we were... <laughs> We were, we were chatting with her, and, and she implied, well, thanks for chatting with me and talking while we're waiting, as if it were small talk. And we were talking about the, the vaccine, everything that everybody's been through. And you said, no, this is meaningful conversation. And I just, I love that about you. And it, it comes through in your music. It comes through in just the essence of, of who you are. And that's a lovely, graceful thing to have in the world now. Well, you were kind to say that, Elizabeth, but it's, I tell you, um, you know, our, well, the, I think the greatest, our greatest mission in the world really is just to connect with one another, to be, you know, to talk to one another, to be kind to one another. I think that surpasses any cause or you know, political viewpoint. Just, you know, just talk to folks. And you do that so wonderfully through your music and your and your songwriting well thank you yeah and you you put out a new album the 12th of june first album in 10 years that's the question what have you been doing <laughs> but i say that but i know and and one of your legacies that i feel like is well known is that you're you're a touring artist you have a touring band you guys like to go play music which is which is wonderful i do i do like to i do like to go play music but I, but you know i it's my job, mm -hmm. which right. that's, you know, that's an incredible, incredible thing. I, you know, I, it sounds funny to, to say that because where, where I grew up outside of Houston, uh, I graduated from high school in 1975. Uh, the idea of making stuff up and going around the world peddling it to people, believe it or not, was not considered a job. Crazy. <laughs> And so I, I always felt conflicted about that. And my mom, my mom, my mom and dad encouraged me uh, endlessly, um, supported my interest. And my, but my mom always had practical advice as well, and would would uh, would always say, "Well, sweetheart, I, I hope this music thing works out for you, but you, it'd be nice if you had a fallback position." <laughs> and and uh, and so I still think of that. You know, I think of. Elizabeth, you you're fascinating because I mean, you grew you're from a musical family. You, know, you didn't have a choice. You were you were going to play and sing. No choice. Play and sing no matter what. But you do so many things. How how does one aspect of your art affect another? Oh well, it's all one just big jumble pie, you know. <laughs> and and even like as you've uh, taken a minute from making records, but that's one of the extensions of what you do. But it seems like the road was really has really been your focus over the last decade. But you also you write songs and then you make records. Those are completely different tasks than getting in a bus with a band and loading into a show and sound checking and playing and tearing it all down and leaving again. It's just it's a completely different 
thing. So, I mean, I feel like you certainly have that too. And you took 10 years to make a record. So what have you been doing? (laughs) (laughs) Well, that is, you know, that is, that's one of the the blessings of, of being, being able to do something like this is that no two days are the same, even, even when you're on the road and, and um, it, it uh, you know, it just it, there's something, something different happening all the time. You know, and you get to meet, you get to meet smart and talented people uh, everywhere you go, and you get to collaborate with people you're a fan of. I mean, how, how great is that? I mean, it's just, it's exciting just to meet somebody you admire, but to get to get to work with them, get to sing a song with somebody, to get to know them actually, to see how they're mind works and why they are who they are. You know, what, the most consistent thing I've discovered among meeting, uh, about meeting people I admire is that, you know, when you get to know somebody that's well known for something, it's no accident. You know, they're, they're really smart and talented. It's one of my favorite things about Torin is the, is the point that you just made. I feel like, sure, you can visit Amsterdam or Atlanta or wherever, but when you land there and you work with local crew, you eat at a local restaurant, you get entrenched with people in a way that you couldn't just as a tourist when you go there and sort of engage with the working economy of live music in that market. And I love that. I feel like I get a sense of a place like, have you been to Amsterdam? But have you really been to Amsterdam? You know, <laughs> maybe that wasn't the best example. <laughs> I'm I'm only slightly concerned, Elizabeth. But... <laughs> I'm just trying to find out what you've been doing, Lyle, and I'm I'm going at it every way I can think of. You know here. The, the... The, my my 2012 release was was the last release for my original record deal with MCA and Curb Records, uh, Curb and Universal. And the first three records of that record deal were produced by Tony Brown right here at MCA Nashville, and and uh, and then they moved my record deal out to Los Angeles. It was not until 2012 that that deal was up, and and so in 2012 I I I thought well I'm gonna you know the the Business had changed quite a bit from 1985 when I signed my deal to 2012, wow. and and uh, I thought, well, I'm going to take a minute to to figure out what you know how I might do the next thing I do, and and then and then my uh, wife and I, uh, my, she was my girlfriend then, but she stuck with me. Uh, we started getting serious about uh, having a family, and and that uh, along with. You know, I do. I we I do play. I mean, that's. I mean, that's how I make a living. But you know, I play 100, 110 dates a year, and and which means I'm gone from home about half the time. But between that and and uh, figuring out how we might have a family, uh, that was, it. Just took a while. To ten, do this years, record. ten years. Ten years goes, goes by quick. It would it would only have been eight. We re- we recorded tracks for the record in November of 2019. Mm-hmm. With the idea we were going to finish the record in March of 2020, uh, I, I recorded here in Nashville with Chuck Ainley uh, at at uh, the at the the room that used to be called Backstage at Soundstage, where I recorded two of my records in the 80s, and and uh, I'd worked with Chuck Ainley on on my third record that Tony Brown produced. Uh, we were gonna yeah we were gonna finish in March of 2020, and we did not. Oh, the best, best laid plans, I know. So COVID hits and you're home. It was, yeah, it, we, and it was, it was, other than running out of money, it was great. It was. <laughs> that was the only thing. <laughs> other than that. It, and not having to be fully clothed all the time. Well, that, you know, I, uh, uh, I appreciate your help with introducing this <laughs> song. Thank you. Here for you. The, the, uh, uh, the you know I, I I I made this song up not about uh, about the pandemic, which I was so proud folks wanted to adopt it as their pandemic song, uh, but but uh, I, I made it up really. I, you know I'm I'm I, uh, our children were born in 2017, and I was 59 years old. So so. Um, it was a revelation. So there was more than one. You said we have twi- twin. Right, we had twins. right. And and a boy and a girl. And and um, 
I always thought I wanted to be a dad, but I had absolutely no idea how much I'd enjoy it. Uh, just every part of it. And, and uh, I, I just remember thinking uh, one day as I was trying to get my little boy dressed and he was resisting that, well, maybe he's right. He's got a point. <laughs> Oh, the night time air was barely breezing well, It was cold but not quite freezing So I looked around to find my trousers And this voice inside my head grew louder Pants is overrated, pants is overrated, pants is overrated Yes, yes, pants is overrated Yes, 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 yes. Well, I never made it out that window. If I'd have even put just one leg in the hole. But as it was the circumstance, I gladly lost my favorite pants. Pants, overrated pants, overrated pants. Yes, 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 yes. Well, my people from across the pond, but they hail from Scotland and beyond. Well, sheep make up for socks and shirts, and grown men run around in skirts. Pants, oh, faded, pants, oh, faded, pants, oh, faded. Yes, yes, pants is overrated, pants is overrated, pants is overrated. Yes, 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 yes. You see the little sheep is big and fat, standing on the hillside, standing in the meadow. See the little sheep is big and fat, they're making me a sweater, they're making me a hat. Well, Lord Jesus knew just what to wear Oh, to live a life in desert air well, He walked the earth in poor man's shoes And sang this night be attitude Pants is overrated, pants is overrated, pants is overrated Yes, yes, pants is overrated, pants is overrated Yes, 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 yes. And now as I sit here in my jeans, I think about what this all means. And children come into this world without a stitch on boy or girl. Pants is overrated, pants is overrated, pants is overrated, yes, yes, pants is overrated, pants is overrated, pants is overrated, yes, yes, pants is overrated, pants is overrated, pants is overrated, yes, yes, pants is overrated, pants is overrated, pants is overrated, yes, 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 yes. Yes, 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 yes. Pants is overrated. So is grammar, too. So I really appreciate that song title. And just to see how much more embarrassing I can make this interview for myself, um, we have never really got to meet or talk before, but we were... We rode on a bus together. We rode on a bus together? Yeah. Was we, I drunk? I we, don't... We were... Uh, it was not a tour bus, but it was a, like a shuttle bus at the beginning of a, of a Kayamo cruise a few years ago. You, were, you, were, you seemed quiet, and uh, you were... I really am. You were, you were over... But no, you were sitting by yourself. It was, it was our band. There were a bunch of us, and we were carrying on, and you were just very quiet sitting in the back, and, and you looked as though you didn't want to be disturbed. 
so we didn't. <laughs> well, well, thank you. What, what I remember about our first encounter is that we were on the ship, and this is back before I knew to, um, to always take the stairs and never get on the elevator, but um, I got on the elevator. You were also on the elevator. You had this big belt buckle on, and it said Lyle. It was such an impressive belt buckle, and I was like looking at your belt buckle, and then you looked up at me, and I was looking at your belt buckle, and I was like, oh, God, that looked bad. But um, <laughs> I was really honest to God well, looking Elizabeth, at your you belt buckle. Well, you just know how to make a you know, person feel uplifted. <laughs> <It's>... <laughs> Well, as, as do you, and, you know, in, in your music, your spirit of, of playfulness um, is one of the many things that, uh, what I love, sometimes when you try to describe an artist's music, it can be uh, kind of difficult. I can think of a million adjectives to describe yours because of how diverse it is, and, and all of the, it can be playful, it can be poignant, tongue-in-cheek, um, all those things. And then the actual musical elements. So there's country, there's swing, there's there's jazz, and certainly big band, um, which was absolutely a foreign thing in my household. We were like a jug band. So tell me about your exposure to that and how it found its way into your music. You know, I grew up in Houston, Texas, and Houston is well. It was you know in the last few years was named the most diverse city in the country. Houston has always been diverse in terms of its musicality, uh, in terms of, you know, country music, like, like Kenny Rogers living in Houston, and uh, uh, in terms of R&B, Archie Bell and the Drills. I mean, there were, there were hits from all over the place yeah, coming from Houston. Uh, when I was high school age and, and I w was able to start going out and listening to music, uh, I could go and hear... Texas singer-songwriters like Guy Clark and Towns Van Zandt and Nancy Griffith and Eric Taylor and Don Sanders and Vince Bell and places that held, you know, that had, had fewer seats than this room. And uh, it was so nice to be able to sit close up with somebody and to watch them perform and to learn about performing. Uh, the, the, the music that the people I went to hear played seemed to be influenced by everything. My, my parents' record collection, my parents you know, were members of the, of the old Columbia uh, Record Club, and they get a new record. But they had, I, and I, I was, I'm an only child, and my parents both worked, and they, were, you know, they taught me how to work the, the record player and, and uh, were fine with me doing it. And so I, I played records after school, and and uh, they had you know their record collection had Glenn Miller records it had, gosh it had uh, it had Ray Price records Ray Charles records Nat King Cole records so all of that music was you know music I listened to and music I I liked and 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 yeah you know, as I took I took guitar lessons uh, my mom would gosh my mom uh, just really went to a lot of trouble for me because she worked in downtown Houston we lived. 28 miles north and west of downtown Houston, and, and once a week for years, she would, after work one day, fight the Houston traffic, which just took about, you know, rush hour in those days, was about an hour and a half from downtown out to where we lived. Pick me up, take me all the way back downtown for a guitar lesson, once a week for, for years and years. And my dad would work late those nights, and, and uh, then we'd all have, after my guitar lesson, we'd pick up my dad, and we'd have supper, one of our favorite places to eat on the way home. Uh, those are wonderful family memories for me. But that sort of exposure to the city and to uh, a wonderful guitar teacher named Chuck Woods uh, and the, you know, his musical taste, and he had he'd played at one time uh, in Jimmy Dean's band, and he was a local session player, and, and uh, you know, learning about the world of music from him and from the Houston radio and my parents' record collection shaped, you know, the, the kind of music I enjoy. I love it. Tell me a little bit about Anderson Fair. Is that right? Anderson Fair Retail Restaurant. It's a play on words, uh, really. It was a, a you know, a, it is. 
still in existence, started in 1969 uh, by two men, one named Anderson and one named Fair. But the, the, uh, the play on words was a, a really uh, was, a, was a tip of the hat to the, the magical place it was, the fairy tale that place was, because it was a group of, group of artists who uh, volunteered their time to sustain it, to, to serve spaghetti lunches. It was kind of a, it was a, a hip, hip, you know, forward thinking, liberal thinking, uh, kind of hole in the wall place that, uh, that if, you know, if a downtown businessman wanted to show his buddies he was cool, he'd take them to the spaghetti lunch at Anderson Fair. And somebody <laughs> like Steven Gerrard would be sitting in the windowsill playing songs, uh, just without a PA. Um, it, it, it's a serious listening room. It's the kind of, the kind of listening room that, that uh, I, I was in there once in the, in the audience, and there were people who, unfamiliar with the place. And uh, it would be like walking into the Bluebird, not realizing what it was. And, and uh, you know, they're carrying on like people normally would, and the owners of, of the place just walking over and handing them their money back and saying, you, I think you're in the wrong place. Oh, wow. and, 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 and so it was, the kind of, it was the kind of place where the audience really listened to who was playing. The first time I played there was frightening because I'd, I'd spent the first couple of years of my performing. I started playing out in 1976 when I was 18, and I played anywhere, anywhere that had me, you know, restaurants, hamburger joints, pizza joints. I was used to people not listening to me, and I was comforted by that. <laughs> <laughs> so the first time somebody, I, I thought, oh, my God, they, they can actually hear what I'm doing. It was frightening. Yeah, then you're all exposed with what you're saying. <laughs> um, you mentioned a play on words, and you also mentioned Jimmy Dean earlier, which made me think of breakfast meat. So um, I thought you might do another song for us, will you? Will you? Or no? Let's do this one off the off the record. Well, and thank you for for mentioning breakfast meat because it, there's uh, <laughs> this is well, th and this is another uh, another another one I was that was inspired by my young son. Uh, so far in his young life, he seems to be vegetarian. Wow. Except. He loves bacon. Loves. <laughs> Thus the song we have, Pig Meat, off his new album, the 12th of June. Do we have that queued up? We're going to give it a listen. Yeah. 
escape pantry Motels of the Dirty country And plenty of it Fried hard It don't matter Bring it to me On a great big ladder I'm a big meat man That's big meat. The records are so great, so well put together. I hear your affinity for great musicianship, great arrangements, all of those things. Oh, thank you so much. You know, it's it's an interesting experience to listen back. You know, you 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 work really in intently, intensely on on a recording, and then then it's kind of done, and then you move. Don't listen to it much after that. So to to hear. You know, and when you hear uh, hear something in in front of other people, you know you kind of listen through their ears. But that, it, 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 so thank you, thank you for playing. I, you know, the it just makes me appreciate the people I work with and play with. Uh, Chuck Chuck Ainley co-produced the record with me and engineered the record. Chuck and I worked together on my third album called And It's Large Band. Chuck engineered that record, recorded and mixed it, and uh, it's the first time I got to work with Chuck since then. Uh, it was a wonderful reunion working with him. The players, the the the, the alto sax solo uh, on, on, is is Brad Lely. Brad Brad Lely is the professor of saxophone at the University of North Texas, and he's only able to tour with us in the summertime because he's teaching the rest of the year. But he he um, he comes comes out and uh, he's, he's just. Yeah, amazing. I met him back in 1990 when he played with Harry Connick, and and we did some things together. But but and Russ Kunkel played drums, and that you know the rhythm that he played, the, and he Russ plays with me live. And the uh, well, I'm just uh, working with talented people is the get you know getting to be around people who are once again people that you look up to and admire, and you've heard on records your whole life is such an inspiring feeling, you know, getting to spend every day on the road or every day at home, you know, on t working with, talking to, working with some capacity with people that you look up to, it just makes you, you know, it just makes you, it makes you want to be better, it makes, and it makes you better. You know? And uh, I've, I've been fortunate to, to be able to do that my whole career, work with people that I admire and, and so thank you for playing playing the record. I want to take a moment to shine a light on someone that I know is important to you musically, um, Francine Reed. Can you talk to us about her? I met Francine Reed in 1984. Matt Rawlings uh, was part of, of the first band that I recorded with. In 1983 in Luxembourg, in Europe, 
I met a band from Phoenix called J. David Sloan and the Rogues. J. David Sloan was the lead singer. Billy Williams was the music director. Billy and J. David had both lived in Nashville for some time. Billy, Billy Williams used to work with Buddy Cannon, used to produce his demos. Billy is a wonderful producer. And, and uh, after meeting them in 1983, I, I went to Phoenix in uh, June of 1984 and recorded four songs with them in one day and uh, kept going back every few weeks that summer until we recorded about 18 songs. Those 18 songs were my, the demo that I shopped around Nashville were the, were, were the songs that uh, became my first album. And, and uh, uh, Matt Rawlings, the summer of 1984, decided that he, he was gonna, he went to, he decided to go to school at Berkeley in Boston and, and uh, take music up there. And and uh, he decided that he was going to play with some different bands around Phoenix that that summer. And and uh, he he told me when we were working in the studio one day, he said, "I am playing this this weekend with this great singer. You got to come check it out." And so I walked into Chewy's in Tempe, Arizona, and Francine Reed was singing her signature song, "Wild Women Don't Get the Blues," and and. Uh, I talked to her after her set was over, and I said, I've got this song that's a, a, a duet and uh, that, I, that I think could be a duet. Would you, would you come sing it with me? And she said she would, and we have been singing together ever since. This, this summer is the first summer in, in ages that, uh, that, I, that Francine hasn't been with us. She decided to retire from, from the road, from traveling. She still does the occasional show herself, but, but she, uh, she decided to... To not tour anymore, so we we missed her. I'm so glad that before the pandemic, we had a chance to record uh, several songs together. Where there are three duets with Francine on this on this record, and and uh, the, this is one that we've been singing live for years, and we thought we'd finally uh, record it. Well, we've got you here live and solo right now. So will you do another one for us? Just you and your lonesome. Well, the, anything. The, I heard you've got a song with Chris Isaac about getting married and having COVID or well, something. Right, but anywhere you want to go, it's it's your oyster. I, I well, I'd be happy to to play it, Chris. You know, uh, I I met Chris uh, years ago, and and uh, he he's always been so kind to me. Uh, we we got to know each other better naturally this summer. We went out tour together. We did twenty dates together across the country, and just had the best time. Um, uh, we did, you know, all uh, get a little under the weather at the same time. I'm not blaming him. I'm. Are you sure? I think of it more as a tribute. Right, right. <laughs> He would, he, we would, uh, we'd, we'd kind of crash each other's sets uh, this summer. And, and so I got to, I surprised him with this one one night. He looked at me. I heard his voice. I sang along. I had no choice. We sang out and breathed life in. We gave each other COVID, now we're married. We sang a lonesome and haunting song. Miss Cindy Walker was never wrong. There is no me. Sweet dream, baby. We gave each other hope, and now we're married. I was his man, much more than most. I never dreamed I'd stand so close to feel this sweat drip from his brow. They say the distance makes hearts grow fonder. Yet when I see him way over yonder, the honey. 
honeymoon seems just a phase. We gave each other gold, and now we're married. I wish him well for all his days, for his mirrored and sequined ways. A love so bright was bound to be. We gave each other COVID. We gave each other Well, your lung capacity seems to be holding out pretty good, so that's good. Um, I'd love to talk with you a little bit about your your writing process, and I'm so fascinated by this, by an artist that goes on. How many records have you made now all together? You know, uh, uh, oh, I, gosh, I don't Fourteen. Four, four, I think 14. 14. 14 but one was a compilation and one was a live album, so 12. I've heard you speak about perspective, and I don't think it really dawned on me until I just listened to James McMurtry's latest record and how all those songs are true from where he sits now and honest from where he sits now. And I'm just, I'm fascinated by um, your ability and, and drive to do that and not worry about, oh, I'm going to make a successful record, or a record in this style, or you're coming from where you're coming from as your perspective shifts through life. So now this album feels a lot about family, things that are relevant to you now. Is that, would you say that's true? Well, that's, that, well thank you for saying that, because it, it uh, I mean, that is, I, I don't know that I, you know, I don't know that I'm enough of a craftsman to be able to write just, you know, if somebody said, well, we need a hit song for such and such, I, you know, I'd, I'd say, well, how do you do that? I'd, and and it, it is, I, I think everyone approaches, the, the uh, everyone has his own creative process. Um, you know, making stuff up is hard. And, <laughs> but, it, but it is, you know, making, making stuff up that you, that you, um, you know, that you're going to, you're going to ask people to sit through. And and you know some people are more polite than others, uh, the, the <laughs> but it is it, it, the, the idea of demanding somebody's attention. Some and 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 so so it's I, I it, the writing process is something I'm. It's a it's a puzzle, a riddle that I'm always trying to figure out. How how does it strike you, Elizabeth? I mean, this is my chance to. I, I have no choice but to be unabashedly honest. I would. I'm, I feel the same way. I wouldn't know how to sit down and like, oh, you should write a song about trucks. You know, I wouldn't know like, well, wow, I better go get one and ride around it and have a couple of accidents. So I have something to say. <laughs> so I'd have something to say about it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> what 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 makes you sit down to write a song? What what what's that first step in writing a new song for you? There is, I mean, usually a visit <laughs> for that some sort of little musical visit that encapsulates a, a feeling or a thought that I'm having, and if it takes a musical form and it feels like it's worthy of a bit of time, I'll jot it in my phone or record it on my phone or make a note somewhere, and then I try to see where where that goes and I, I love it I find it mysterious too uh, I wish I could I wish I knew how to game it better but it doesn't seem completely reliant on my will to we, do it we'd be able to do it more often if if it were right. yes not 10 years between albums like some people <laughs> my record's six I've only had six years in between albums so far but it ain't over yet so <laughs> We'll see. Well, coming into this era of your life, having a family relatively late in life, leading us to the track of the title track of of the album, it's such a sweet, pure, honest thing. How did you find that that journey to to be? Well, and and I I didn't. Uh, you know, some of my friends uh, teased me uh, when 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 they knew we were going to have children. 
and, and said, oh, your life is going to change. And, and I would say, no, it's not. Uh, but of course it does, you know, and, and in ways you don't expect. And, 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 but for me, my, my life has not changed in one single way that I haven't wanted it to. I mean, every, every change has been, you know, uh, well, a revelation and joyful and just, you know, you just, it's something that I have been happy to experience. The, the, thinking about, you know, ha having children, for me, at, at my age, uh, you know, I, I never thought about my age, really, I, I, until I never started doing the math, until, until uh, you know, I knew I, was, I would become a dad. And and I started thinking about well, how old will I be when they start school? How old will you know? Will I get to see them graduate from school? And so it makes you think about your whole life in a different way. You know, it makes you think about your the family that you're about to have. It makes you think about the family, your family in the past, and and it helps you to imagine you know having family in the future. Will you do Twelfth of June? I would be happy to. This is the title track off the new album. We're, my family is, uh, uh, the Lovitz are from San Jacinto County in East Texas. They came there in 1850 from somewhere in Georgia. We don't, don't know much about them uh, before they got to San Jacinto County. Uh, we have a family cemetery there with graves that go back to the, uh, well, those days. And, and um, uh, it uh, sits uh, right next to a little tributary to the main creek, a little, little uh, ditch, really, that the all the, the old folks in the family called the branch. Before spring turned into summer, after night turned into day, they were born a Monday morning in the days just after May. In the days just after me By the branch It's angel sun Play for me A happy tune And know all the days I love I love best the 12th of June I love best the 12th of June But he was strong across his shoulders She was delicate of skin And their mother laid their ashen As we held them to our breasts As we held them to our breasts i 
change of sin Play for me a happy tune And know of all the days I love I love best to throw up the dream So many days I've loved Oh, all the days I love I love best the 12th of June I love best the 12th of June mm, I love it, everybody.